In this video, we're going to learn about measures of central tendency, something you've probably learned about in the past, but we're going to go beyond that by introducing some mathematical symbols, just a bit of notation, so we can start getting used to that. Now, it may seem a little unnecessary to do that for something as simple as the mean, but as we learn more complex analyses, it's going to become more and more important to rely on notation to keep track of what we're referring to. So it ends up being really helpful, so bear with me for now on that. But for now, let's talk about measures of central tendency. These are simply numbers that represent the center or the middle of a distribution of data. And as you saw on the last slide, we have three that we're going to talk about today. The mean, median, and mode, starting with the mean. So I have some jargon in this definition, but don't be intimidated by jargon. Always just refer back to your own understanding, and the jargon will start to make sense. The mean is simply the sum of a set of scores divided by the total number of scores in the set. This is just a fancy way of saying that the mean is just adding up all the numbers you have and dividing by how many numbers you just added up. And as I mentioned, we have some notation to get used to and to learn here. Now the notation differs depending on whether you're referring to populations or samples. If you're talking about a population, we use this symbol here. It's a Greek letter. You'll often see, not always, but very often, you'll find that uh, Greek letters are used to refer to population parameters, whereas English letters are used to refer to sample statistics. But uh, this symbol here is called mu, spelled M-U, and just means the population mean. Now for a sample, we have two different symbols we can use to refer to a sample mean. The first is X bar, and the second is capital M. Now, which you use will depend on the field you're in, but I'm going to stick with X bar. So let's start to develop a formula for the population mean. I'm going to just translate some of that jargony definition we had earlier into mathematical symbols, because it would be really annoying to have to write out that definition every time you calculated the mean. Instead, we can just save some time by using symbols. And so here we have mu equals the sum of the scores divided by the number of the scores you're adding up. And we can translate that even further, like so. So here's our formula for the population mean. There might be some new stuff in here, so let me walk you through it. We have on the left the population mean, mu, that's what we're calculating. On the right, in the denominator, we have capital N, that's simply the number of scores that you're adding up. And the numerator just means adding up all the scores, and let me break that down. So x sub i is how you read that term on the right, and sub means subscript here. The i is in the subscript of x. This just means each score in the data set. i is sort of an index number that refers to each individual. Now next to x sub i, we have sigma, which just means take the sum of whatever follows. And so this entire term here can kind of be interpreted like so. Take the sum of each score in the data set, and then divide by the number of scores in the data set, which is how you understand the mean. And here's the formula for the sample mean. You're going to notice a lot of similarities, but a couple of key differences. We obviously are using x bar now on the left to refer to the sample mean, and we also have in the denominator little n instead of big N. This is important. It doesn't change any calculations. The numbers will still be the same, but what we're referring to changes. Capital N means the population size, but now we're not referring to populations. We're referring to samples. So little n means your sample size. Okay, that's enough of the mean for now. We'll come back to it later. Uh, let's talk briefly about the median and mode. The median is just the point at which half the values in the data set are above it, and half of the values in the data set are below it. So it's sort of the true middle, it's the center of the data set in sort of the truest sense. Calculating the median is very simple. We'll talk about it in the next video, but it's so quick to mention, I might as well include it now. All you have to do is list the values in order. I write ascending order here, but descending works as well. And pick the middlemost score in the set, and that's your median. And finally, we have the mode. Now the mode is a average, just like the others, but it's an average of a very different nature. In fact, it's the value in a distribution of data that occurs most frequently, so it's very different than the rest. But the beauty of the mode is that you can calculate it even if you don't have numbers in your data set. So let me illustrate. Here's a data set where we have 
uh, basically beverage orders being described here. So we have date, we have customer name, and we have uh, the beverages that each customer ordered. And we can calculate the mode. You can do it informally now. What's the most common uh, value, uh, per se, in this, in this data set? Well, we have chai teas ordered four times, a latte was ordered only once, and espressos were ordered seven times. So in this case, seven is the most common value. So espresso is the mode of this variable, of this data set here. So it's really powerful to have that flexibility. And going along with this idea of, you know, the mean, for example, kind of having this limitation of, you know, we can't calculate the mean of beverages. It just doesn't make sense. There's also one other major limitation of the mean that, you know, some people tend to forget. So in a perfectly normal distribution, called a bell curve distribution, because if we were to draw uh, kind of a line describing this distribution, it would kind of look like a bell, more or less. In a perfectly normal bell curve distribution, the mean median and mode are all equal to one another. They're all right here at five. But what happens when you have a skewed distribution? In that case, the three measures of central tendency will be differentially influenced. The mean is heavily influenced by skew, the median is moderately influenced by skew, and the mode is relatively immune to skew. So that's another point in favor of the mode. And let me illustrate. Here's an example of a distribution that we refer to as negatively or left skewed. These two terms are interchangeable. We call it negatively or left skewed because the skew is heading in the negative direction. This right here being the skew. It's the outliers. It's, it's what's uncommon, what's being pulled away from you know, the majority of the data, which is all contained over here. So in this case, the mode is going to be at the highest point. It doesn't care about what's going on over here. The median cares a little bit. It'll be pulled slightly in this direction. And the mean is really influenced by skew. Now, we also have positively or right skewed distributions of data. So you can kind of infer why we call it this. Uh, the skew is essentially in the right direction in this case. It's in the positive direction. That's where the outliers are. And things work kind of the same way. The mode doesn't really care about that skew. It's still at the highest point in the data set. The median cares a little bit. It's influenced a little bit by the skew. And the mean is really pulled by that skew. Now I want to take one more second to really highlight this idea that the mean is especially susceptible to extreme values or outliers in a data set. Let me give you some numbers to, uh, to, to throw along with that idea. So let's say we have this data set here. We have 1, 1, 3, 3, 3, 4, and let's say 1,000, right? An extreme outlier here, really out of the way from the rest. Now, in this case, let's test ourselves. What are the three measures of central tendency? In this case, the mean, I'll tell you in a moment. The median is going to be relatively easy to calculate, especially since the numbers are already in order. And the mode should be relatively easy to see as well, especially since we don't have too many uh, different numbers to look at here. So the mode is three. There's three threes in the data set. That's the most common value. The median is three as well. It's in the center of the data set. But the mean in this case, I'll just tell you is 145. So really influenced by that skew. Now in this case, the mean might be, you know, not the best measure of central tendency here because it doesn't do the best job of really reflecting where the center or middle of my data set is. And in contrast, this is a case where the median and mode might be better because this is a better reflection of sort of the middle of the data set. So it's always important to keep in mind when you're looking at different statistics, the pros and cons of each and what you should use.